All right, we are going to talk about one of my absolute favorite applications of the tree data structure, and that is Huffman encoding. So just as an, a little example, I put together a string, uh, just kind of an eight character DNA sequence. And then over here, I put all of the characters used, so ATCG, the frequency with which they occur, and um, If you were to encode this in ASCII, um, each of these characters would be eight bits. Uh, and you know, if you're one of those C and C++ aficionados, yes, there is a terminating null on here, but we're not going to worry about that for the purposes of this explanation. Um, and if you don't know what I was talking about with the terminating null, do not worry about it. Um, so let's say, all right, we have eight characters. That is. Uh, 64 bits because 8 bits per character um, so it, that may not seem like a lot but it, DNA sequences can get pretty long so that that can add up really really quickly um, so over here I kind of made like a naive encoding using just a binary representation of each of these characters um, and because of the properties of binary um, you only have a two character alphabet. We need to represent four characters. So this is kind of an equation that will give you the minimum number of uh, binary characters you will need per other form of character to represent uh, everything. So if we have four characters uh, each, we only have two binary characters. So log two of four is two. And if we use that format, we end up using only 16 bits to represent this string. Um, but with Huffman encoding, we ask, you know, can we do better? Can we optimize this? And uh, it turns out we can. So for this example, um, and just a disclaimer, this is just kind of to give you an example of how Huffman coding works, uh, or Huffman encoding. Um, it's not really going to be an instruction set of how to implement it. I'm not going to really even talk about, you know, stacks or queues or, or any other, other data structure you'll use to actually implement this. I'm just going to kind of give you an idea of generally how it works. So first things first, we're going to add up all these frequencies to find our total number of, of uh, character occurrences, which is eight. And then we're going to use that for our root node for this tree that we're going to be building. Now we're going to do a left branch and a right branch. And on each of these branches, we're going to put a little leaf. Now on the left side, I am going to put the frequency that is highest. So it would be four and four corresponds to a. Then we are going to label these branches. So I'm going to go one zero. You can do zero one or one zero. Um, it really doesn't matter. You just have to be consistent. So the, the same side needs to get the same label each time. And I'll explain why later, but that, that is very important. Just make sure that your naming conventions for these branches is consistent. Then uh, eight minus four is four. So we have four character instances left to account for. We're going to put two more branches, and then we're going to say, um, no, and two more leaves. Then we're going to say, all right, which of these characters occurs next most frequently? And it's T, and it occurs twice. And then label the branch, label the branch, and subtract. We have two remaining. Now, two more branches, two more leaves or nodes, because this, both of these turn into a, uh, a parent of two other nodes. So these aren't leaves anymore. Uh, and then, what the heck, let's, let's label them early, <laughs> the, the branches. And then we have a C and a G. And both of these guys occur with the same frequency. So uh, I'm, I've already wrote, uh, I already wrote A, T, C, and G. So I'm just going to kind of keep that consistent. But I mean, you can you can mix and match, go nuts. <laughs> um, all right. So now we're at the fun part. We're uh, we're actually going to encode these different 
these different characters. And now you may have already kind of caught on to generally what this is going to look like, but uh, it's, it's just super, super cool. We're going to actually just do a traversal of this tree and use that as our encoding. So to get to A, you only need to take one jump, and that is going to be a 1 for that branch right there. Then to get to T, 0, 1. And you're just going to keep going like that down this tree. So to get to C, 0, 0, 1. 0, 0, 0 to get to G. And you'll notice that the most frequently occurring characters have the shortest encodings and the least frequently occurring have the longest encodings. Um, and I'm going to pause here to touch on what I was what I was talking about with that naming convention ne needing to be consistent. So let's say that for T, we had decided to encode it as 1, 1 instead of 0, 1. Um, or we'd kind of switched around the branches and, and done like instead of 0, 1, we'd done like a a one zero or something I, I we'll, we'll stick with this um, so if you look at this that could be an A an A an A it could be a T A or it could be an A and then a T like this is this is woefully um, non-specific like this could be interpreted multiple different ways and you do not want that in an encoding uh, that kind of defeats the whole purpose of being able to decode your encoding um, so with Huffman codes this will not happen you're gonna kind of you're, you're gonna be sure that your prefix uh, does not conflict with any other characters like this is only ever gonna be a and then if it's an a and a T nothing else is gonna look like um, you know, one zero one because this is preceded by two zeros. So your code is going to be decodable one hundred percent of the time, and that is that is the whole purpose, or uh, well, part of the purpose is to make sure that you can actually decode it. And now we go back to the reason that we did this was to see if we could actually save space. So let's go through this and double check to see that we did in fact save a little bit of space. So A is now one bit, so one, two, three, four. T is two bits, so one, two, four. So that's eight total bits so far. And then C is three, and G is three. And that's you know way more than over here, but these only occur twice. So you're actually gonna get eight plus six, which is 14. Um, and that's, that's a savings of two bits. Um, let's write that down. Oh yeah, saved two bits. And now this may not seem like a lot, but that's only for an eight character string. And that's some, that's like a, a, a 12 or 13% savings, right? And like I said, DNA encodings, or you know, if you have like an image, if you have an encoding of an image, like a JPEG or a PNG, you're gonna have a lot of bits and so saving 12 or 13 percent is a big deal um, so this can become quite significant as your as your data gets larger and larger so that's kind of the general idea of Huffman encoding um, like I said this isn't this isn't a uh, I'm gonna make the C look nice let's do that one yeah that's better <laughs> um, but yeah, so like I said, this is this is not to, to, to show you exactly how you should implement this. This is just to kind of give you an idea of how this process works. Um, so yeah, we go from a naive encoding to a Huffman encoding and you save some bits. All right, thanks for watching.